Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I want to uh, start by saying that I feel specially privileged to uh, engage Professor Mamdani in conversation, not only because he is a scholar of great distinction uh, and a very fine thinker, but also because, if I may say so, and I think that there may well be some of you here who might not agree with my observation, but I think that in India, the vast majority of our conversations are only about India. I think there is a certain insularity in our media. I'm always surprised by how little coverage there is of the rest of the world in the Indian press, in Indian newspapers. And Professor Mambani has, of course, as has been mentioned, uh, written about the question of citizenship, sovereignty, violence, genocide, the nation state in Sudan, in South Africa, in Rwanda, in Uganda, Palestine, Israel, and the whole question of settler colonialism. So let me begin on a personal note. Let me begin by asking you that you grew up in Kampala, in East Africa. What vantage point do you think you might have possibly derived from having grown up there in looking into these questions? Thank you first for inviting me to this uh, fascinating conference the last two days. I grew up in Uganda. I was third generation of Indian descent in East Africa. One of the things about being a migrant is that you're never completely an insider. You're always both an outsider and an insider. And that gives you a privileged position. That privilege is to be both self-critical and to take all insider claims with a pinch of salt. So that's what I grew up with. At the same time, of course, I was an Indian in East Africa. I had grown up during the colonial period where East African Indians had enjoyed a degree of petty privilege if you compared us to the natives of the country, what were called Africans. And so we looked at the world through racially tinted glasses. We tended to assume that we were better off because we were smarter. And they were not because they were lazy. This is standard racist stuff coming out of colonialism. So one of the questions for me as I look back is, how does a kid coming out of that kind of a context develop the capacity or get the opportunity to rise above it and to see through your own act. African Americans say the hardest act to understand is your own. You can critique other people, but wisdom is when you begin to see what's wrong with your own claims. So let me, let me also ask you, before I move into the subject of your book, of your most recent book, um, and please feel free to ignore this question, and, and you'll see why I'm adding that caveat right at the beginning. That, you know, for someone of my generation, the first awareness I had of there being Indians in Africa was not through history books. It was through V.S. Naipaul. And I'm thinking in particular, of course, of a bend in the river. Now, we all know that Naipaul has been derided, critiqued, many would say entirely justifiably for a certain kind of racism. But do you think, given the fact that he is a writer of extraordinary distinction and that he has certain powers of perception, did you, do you think that some insights are to be derived from his writings and did you derive any insights from his writings in particular on Africa? Of course, Naipaul is a writer who cannot be ignored. 
is a writer who has a very acute sense of the present. He can cut through it, but he doesn't have much of a historical sense. He critiques the present as if all the actors in the present had the powers to define themselves differently. Now, I don't believe that we are prisoners of history, but I don't think that history is unimportant. I think we're shaped by history, but there are choices. I'll give you an example. South Africa. In South Africa, you had anti-apartheid organizations. You had the African National Congress. You had the Indian National Congress, Gandhi's. You had the Colored People's Congress. And you had the Congress of Democrats. But the interesting thing is that all of them organized only their own particular race. They accepted as natural the political architecture of apartheid. And that was true until the 1970s. It's only in the 1970s that Steve Biko comes with black consciousness and he says, black is not a color. Black is an experience. If you are oppressed, you are black. And Steve Biko breaks down the racial walls between Indians, coloreds, Africans, and creates a student movement that now overturns the apartheid architecture. And it is in the 70s that you begin a process which ends in the 1990s. So, to return to Naipaul, Naipaul could critique with a razor's edge but Naipaul could not provide you with the glimpse of an alternative world. The real challenge is not simply to critique, is to arrive at an alternative. That's my view of Naipaul. But, uh, apropos of that, um, uh, I found it very interesting that you said that uh, black is not a color, as it was related to you, it's an experience. Much in the way in which white is not a color, it is a privilege. And then it's, of course, the rest of us who are just people of color. But I leave that aside for the moment because, as you know, there is a very interesting politics of what we might describe the people of color. Let me move on to the subject of your most recent book, which is called Neither Settler Nor Native, The Making and Unmaking of Permanent Minorities. I'd like you to explain what the subject matter of the book is but in explaining that, I, would also, I also wonder if you might be able to comment on something that has struck me in my study of history, which is that I think that the concept of majority and minority, both, are a form of modern political arithmetic, which is to say that I think for centuries, over nearly every part of the world, people seldom thought of themselves as majorities or minorities. I wonder whether the Jews in India, a very small number, and what is very distinctive about the Jews of India is that it is one country where every scholar of world Judaism admits there has never been any instance of anti-Semitism in the history of Jews in India. Now, the Jews never thought of themselves, it seems to me, as a minority, at least in India. Now, they may have thought of themselves as that in the Ottoman Empire, in various ways, but nonetheless, I'm saying in totality, it seems to me that this concept of majority and minority is a certain way of thinking which really derives from a kind of political modernity. So, I wonder if that might have been, whether you, number one, you would agree with that, and whether that has in any way informed the subject matter of your book. Well, you write that majority, minority are not, in a political sense, they are not trans-historical. They are modern terms. But by modern, I do not mean contemporary terms. For me, modernity begins in 1492. 
It begins with the establishment of the Castilian Empire in Spain. It begins with the claim of one country, one religion, one people. And the expulsion of Jews and Muslims from Spain, the Jews expelled from Spain are welcomed into the Ottoman Empire. If you look at the Jewish experience globally, the Jewish experience in Europe is very different from the Jewish experience in Middle East or in Asia. In Middle East and Asia, the Jews were part of society. You take the example of the Middle Eastern Jews who came into Israel, known as the Mizrahim. The Mizrahim wrote in Arabic, spoke Arabic, their language was Arabic, their culture was Arabic, their religion was Jewish. When they first came in, the Ashkenazi le leaders in Israel looked at them and said, what is this savage rubble? And one of the biggest social projects in Israel was to de-Arabize the Mizrahim. Right? And the Mizrahim then took possession. They, they provided the muscle for religious Zionism and the religious Zionist parties which have today taken over Israel. And for the Mizrahim, there were two enemies, Palestinians, but also the Ashkenazi, the European Jews. And that's the fight you are seeing in Israel today. Israel has had a problem it has not been able to solve, which is, who is a Jew? How do you define a Jew? There are still today two definitions of Jew in Israel. One is a broader definition which is contained, contained in the law of return. The other is an extremely narrow definition in religious law. Because personal law, if you are Jew, your personal law will be Jewish. In halakha law, the Jew is defined very differently from how it is defined by the state. Now the problem is this, that if Israel is to be a Jewish state, it has had to homogenize the Jews and destroy the diversity of the Jewish experience globally. That is the crisis you are seeing in Israel today. Uh, what you say reminds me of uh, an extraordinary anecdote that I read in a book written by a colleague of yours at Columbia University, Mark Mazover, who wrote a book called Salonika. Uh, this is also the city which is known as Thessal Thessalonica. And he narrates that during the time of World War II, so Salonika came under Nazi occupation. And when the Nazi commander arrived in Salonika, he asked, where is the ghetto? Because the experience in the rest of Europe, particularly Western Europe, large parts of Eastern Europe as well was, Jews generally lived in ghettos. Germany was actually somewhat of an exception, but they lived in ghettos, particularly Eastern Europe. And he was told, there is no ghetto for the Jews here. Because in the same street, you would find an Orthodox church, a Greek Orthodox church, a Syrian Orthodox church, a Protestant church, a mosque. And this Nazi commander writes home to his boss, back in Berlin saying, these people are uncivilized. They don't realize that you have to put the Jew in a ghetto. I mean, it's just chilling when you think about it, right? So I'm kind of reminded when you're, when you're talking about Israel as well, in a sense, because there is a certain kind of, if I may put it on here, I'm doing it metaphorically, a certain kind of ghettoization of Jewish identity. But I would caution us. Uh, to exceptionalize the Nazis. Uh, what was the Nazi project? The Nazi project was to purify Germany, to rid Germany of all minorities. And the first minority were the Jews, but the Jews were not the only one. The only there were also others, right? Yes. When Nazism was, when the Nazi party was defeated, and the Americans came in, and the Nuremberg trials were held. 
There was no questioning the project, the political project of the Nazis. All they did was to start identifying individual Nazis who had committed war crimes. Right? Tens of thousands of them. Right? But never what was the political project. And they reproduced the Nazi political project in Eastern Europe by throwing out ethnic minorities and in Germany itself by not reintegrating Jews in Germany but now supporting the project for a homeland for Jews outside Europe. The Nazi project continues in my view, right? But the Nazi project in my view is also global in this sense. Permanent minorities today exists everywhere the nation state is considered to be a worthy goal. Yes. I'll give you an example from India. Although my book is not about India, but since the audience is, is Indian, um, I'll give you an example from India. The debate between Gandhi and Ambedkar in the 1930s in Pune. Ambedkar basically made a demand that Dalits should have what Muslims have got, mm. which is special seats, special electorate. Gandhi said no. Why not? Because Gandhi said Muslims are a minority, Dalits are not a minority. Mm. Why not? Because Muslims are not Hindu, but Dalits are Hindu. Ambedkar was not convinced at all. Ambedkar writes in his book that actually he was blackmailed by Gandhi because Gandhi put Ambedkar in a situation that if Gandhi fasted until death, Ambedkar would be held responsible for Gandhi's death. Now, I derive the point that is of interest for me, which is how are minorities defined in India? Minorities are defined as religious groups which are not Hindu. Okay? Meaning, religion is politicized. There are hundreds of minorities in India, not just religious minorities, all kinds of minorities. But the rest of them are not of significance politically. It's only the religious minority that is of significance. Mm. Now, this is not just an Indian thing. Mm. You can look at the whole of Asia. Look at, you can look at the China, the Uyghurs, Tibetans. You can look at Turkey, the Kurds. You can look at Iran, the Shias. You can look at Pakistan, the Shias, the Ahmadiyyas, etc. The whole of Asia has got a minority question which is becoming a burning political question. Mm. Here in this conference, I mean for me for the last two days, it's been an amazing experience to, to hear and witness the incredible self-confidence, enthusiasm, determination of the economic class in India when they talk of business, industry, gold, all of these things, right? But the thing is, the economy is not the only thing. We are at a crossroads. It's as if two trains are running and whether they will collide or not, because the other mm. train is the politics. Mm. The economy is opening, the politics is closing. Mm. That needs a discussion. Well, you know, um, uh, the communal path to which you had uh, referred is a matter of uh, uh, great debate. And I won't really get into that question of the differences between, between Gandhi and Ambedkar and how to interpret the whole question of minorities with regards to their views. But I just want to, uh, want to see if I might rephrase some of the things you have said in a very simple sentence and see whether you would agree with that because that might be a way for uh, people to get a grasp on some of the issues that you're tackling. Would it be correct to say that the question that, that, or at least one of the questions that fundamentally animates you is a question of who belongs to the nation state and who doesn't? 
Would this be the simplest way of, of characterizing? Of course. Yes. All right. So what is the distinction then between immigrants and settlers as you see it? Because that distinction, I think, is important to your book. So let me... This question has two parts to it. Yes. Okay. Of course, who belongs to the nation state and who doesn't is kind of the central question here. Right? Because to me, I begin with a commitment to democracy. Yeah. Okay. Democracy presumes that majorities and minorities are the result of the democratic process. They don't pre-exist. Before the democratic process, there is no majority and there is no minority politically. Mm -hmm. right? And therefore, majorities and minorities are temporary as they move from one political cycle to another. Every minority can expect to become a majority tomorrow. And every majority is cautious that if it doesn't deliver, it may become a minority. Yeah. But with the nation state, you have permanent minorities which pre-exist the democratic process. That's the problem. The nation state compromises the democratic process. Okay. So that's the first part of your question. The second part of your question, sorry, please just remind me. Uh, the second part of the question was what are the differences oh, yes. between immigrants immigrant immigrant and settlers? And settler, yeah. Yeah. Now, immigrants have existed time immemorial. If you go far enough, all our ancestors came from Africa, right? Actually, they came from East Africa, right? And then they spread around the world, right? Those are immigrants. Mm. Immigration is in the human DNA. Right? Settler is a very different thing. Settler is a very modern phenomenon. The settler arrives, and the settler is not willing to accept the political arrangement in the community to which he or she has moved. Mm. The settler wants to create his and her own state. Mm. That's a settler. If you look at the history of Palestine, the first Jewish aliyah which arrives has no ambition to create a state. It becomes part of the society it moves to. Right? Jews from time immemorial have been natives of Palestine and have immigrated into Palestine. Mm -hmm. But it's only with the second and the third aliyah that Jewish, Jew, the Zionist immigrants have the ambition to create their own state. Their own state. Israel is Jewish and democratic. Not democratic. Yes. Democracy only for Jews. There's the problem. Yes. So, um, it, seems, it seems that one of the arguments that is intrinsic to this book, and I, perhaps to much of your work, is a certain argument about the nation state, the problem of the nation state. Historically, we have had many ways to imagine the idea of a political community. It appears whether one goes back to 1492 or whether one goes back to the Treaty of Westphalia, we won't get into that distinction for the moment, but let's just suppose that the, project, the idea of the nation state is three, four hundred, five hundred years old. Would it be correct to say that the, native st the, the nation state is what has really captured and encapsulated the idea of political modernity and that the fundamental problem is that the nation state is in fact a very impoverished thing, that it is incapable of accommodating the kind of difference that is so critical to human experience. Let's take the example of America, because I think that expresses the problem at its most acute. On the one hand, America has been a society that has shown amazing capacity to accommodate difference to take in immigrants. Okay. On the other hand, America lives with an original sin. Mm. The original sin is conquest in 1492, which is the conquest of the natives. 
the American Indians. The American Indians had two kinds of a fate. One was genocide, then there were those who remained. Those who remained, Lincoln devised a solution for them, which was reservations. American Indians in reservations do not enjoy the liberties that citizens in the U.S. do. In 1964, the U.S. passed a Civil Rights Act. The Civil Rights Act did not apply to Indians in reservations. In 68, they passed another act, the Indian Civil Rights Act. But the civil rights in that act could not be enforced. They were advisory. Why? Because even today, the reservations are run by a colonial bureaucracy. They are not, they, the Indians in the reservations are guardians of U.S. Congress. Okay. So there you are. On the one hand, America, with this amazing capacity to absorb. On the other hand, Indians in the reservations who remain colonized, continuing today. For me, the lesson is this. America has, historically, two groups of people on which America has been built. One is the Indians, who lost their land, and the other are the Africans, who were enslaved, and whose labor built America. Mm. But they were in two different political situations. The Africans, now we call them African Americans, were part of a single polity called USA. They were part of a single state. The Indians were part of a two-state system. A sovereign state, USA, and a protectorate, the reservations. And the Indians have remained fragmented. They have remained weak for centuries. The Africans have been able to mobilize build alliances, even though they are only 15% of the population. Today they are in the leadership, think of Black Lives Matter. They are in the leadership of political reform. They have provided an agenda for political reform. It's not about numbers. Numbers is not the most important thing. Right. It's about the structural context in which these numbers find themselves and the vision with which they put together a future. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mamdani, for your uh, enlightening views. I've been uh, told that the time is up, so thank you very much. Thank you. ABP Mazhar, Uda Dole, Bagha Neet.